I am, we, we are recording this. So this will be available on the College and Career website at Westlake High School, as well as um, on our counseling website at Westlake High School. And um, we also just wanna let you guys know that closed captioning is available should you need it. Any questions for Mr. Schwartz, go ahead and put them in the chat. And together, um, Mr. Schwartz and I will make sure that there's time at the end to make sure any questions that aren't answered through the presentation are answered at the end. So thank you again, Mr. Schwartz, for being here. And I'm going to turn it over to you. Ms. Kirksey, I very much appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for having me. Westlake families, boy, it's been a long time since I've had the opportunity to chat with you either via a virtual lens or visiting campus. Um, I want to start because it's been so many years that I don't think any of you probably know who I am. Uh, let me start with a brief introduction and then we'll go ahead and dive right into tonight's presentation. My name is Rob Schwartz. I wear two hats in the college counseling field. The first is uh, I am an independent educational consultant or a, a college counselor for hire. Families I work with throughout the state of California and a few outside the state uh, will work with me when they have particular questions. They want additional ideas, want help with how to build the right college lists, essay editing, narrowing the list, using the timing, extracurricular development, all sorts of fun stuff that all counselors are capable of doing. I don't want to give you the impression that I'm you know, somehow better. The second hat that I wear is I teach college counseling for UCLA. Uh, I am in their certificate program. So if you had a bachelor's degree and you decided you wanted to change careers and become a college counselor, but you didn't necessarily want to get a PPS degree and work at a school, um, you might want to get a certificate um, from UCLA. There's a, four or five other programs uh, that are offered at other schools. I'd like to think ours is the best one though. Uh, and basically once a year, uh, along with a sprinkling of other events, I will kind of pop in and teach a class and work with students uh, who are interested in working on that side of the argument. So without any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and expand to the presentation screen and go ahead and get going. Tonight's topic is, if it was good enough for us, some of the most uh, some of the nation's most successful, wealthy, and powerful people attended colleges and universities that are anything but elite. What really matters and why when it comes to selecting your college? Um, this is actually the title of a book that I've been working on for the past year, and much of the presentation materials you're going to see come from the research I've done in my book. So what are we talking about? Uh, we're going to talk about some industry trends, what's kind of going on the last couple of years, um, the who is us. I'm going to give you a sampling of the people I'm talking about and why they are, are significant. We're going to talk about some data that I found from Georgetown University uh, that's going to help us better understand what stuff really matters and maybe what doesn't quite matter as much when it comes to this process. Um, why should we care about this process? And, and frankly, how do we look for the right schools? Uh, and what things really do matter in the pursuit of college and frankly, college admission. I'm gonna hang on to that. It's gonna be kind of dependent on how fast we get through the first three quarters of the presentation. We'll determine if we get to that part. But come hell or high water, there will be Q&A. So if you do have a question, feel free to populate it into the chat. I'm not going to answer it during the presentation until we get to the end. So keep that in mind, but I will answer everything I possibly can. So first off, one of my heroes. Do you guys know who this person is? No, don't shout out. Just in your mind, who is this dude? You know, his name is Sir Richard Branson, for those who are wondering. Do you know what he does for a living? Take a second. Think about it. He looks familiar. Seems happy enough. What does this guy do? Uh, for those of you who have heard of the Virgin label, Virgin Galactic, Virgin Airlines. Uh, there's about 180 or so different Virgin labels. He owns all of them. He is a multi-billionaire. Uh, he is knighted by the, God rest her soul, the Queen of England. Um, and where did this guy go to college? Anybody know where this guy went to college? Multi-billionaire, entrepreneurial genius, 
philanthropist. He didn't go to college. Uh, he's a high school dropout. Uh, he's also dyslexic. Um, I show this to you not because this is the focus of tonight's presentation, but to let you know that, look, you can come from anywhere, have any background, have any education, and can still be happy and can still be successful. It's about you. It's about your drive. It's about your initiative. So no matter what you walk away with tonight, keep this in mind. And you're going to get a slide in just a couple of minutes. It's going to reiterate this, this particular sentiment. Okay, so what does the scene of college admission look like today? So at the highest rated or most selective, and most selective meaning the most difficult schools to get into by percentage, um, it has gotten tougher almost every year and at almost every one of the schools. Uh, as a matter of fact, 23 of the 25 most selective schools in the United States this past year either were just as difficult to get into or were even more difficult than just the year before. However, admissions just about everywhere else was either neutral or got easier to get in. The number of people who want to attend college in the United States has steadily declined since about 2010, um, but the trend has accelerated since COVID arrived in 2020. But the number of applications year over year went up 20%. How is all of that possible? What else is going on? So we have a growing distrust of the college universe. I mean, how many times have we heard some sort of pundit, and I'm not even going to get into the political arguments here, but someone who says college isn't worth it anymore, you don't need it, you can get all the information you need from college online for little money or no money, you can skip all the classes that are really meaningless in terms of carving out a career. You can go to trade schools. You can do lots of other things. Why spend the time, energy, and effort on a four-year college degree? There's also a lot of lower-income families that were forced to ditch this, this goal or dream of college because they needed to make up income that was lost during the pandemic. Then there's the group of families that say the cost of college simply is no longer in the realm of affordable. We've seen a steady increase, just like everything else in the world. We've seen just in the past couple of years, inflation go nuts. But in terms of college admission and the cost of college, it's been a fairly steady 3 to 4% every single year. You start adding up 3 to 4%, 3 to 4%, 3 to 4%. After 20 years, you go, wow, it used to be affordable. And now, maybe not so much. Okay. So good enough for whom? Let's go back to the, the title. Who are the people I'm talking about? Who is this, this book based upon? Uh, the next two screens are going to give you a sample. And literally, I'm talking about a small sample of the people I'm talking about. I don't even want you to look at the names yet. I just want you to look at the right side of the screen where it says undergraduate school. And so you see University of Iowa, 84%. That is last year's admission percentage at Iowa. Michigan State, 76%. DePaul University, where's that? 68%. Arkansas, 78%. UNLV, 81%. Northern Michigan, 67%. Delaware, 63%. Hanover College, 69%. Tennessee State, 57%. University of Maine, 92%. These people are clearly losers, right? Look where they went to school. Now take a look at their names and what they do and what they've accomplished. You know, Dan Gilbert is, I'm sure one of his businesses is not too good right now. And, and he's the CEO of Rocket Mortgage, but he's also the CEO of the Cleveland Cavaliers and NBA franchise, multi-billionaire. Dan Quayle, former U.S. Vice President. Doug McMillan, CEO of Walmart. You've probably heard of it. Uh, Howard Schultz, CEO of Starbucks. You've probably heard of it. You probably consumed his product in the last 24 hours. Joe Biden, current president of the United States of America. Mike Pence, former vice president of the United States of America. Oprah Winfrey, enough said. Stephen King, perhaps one of the best-selling authors in American history. Next page, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Who knew Arnold went to college? I actually didn't until I started doing this research. Uh, Carrie Underwood went to a school that you can literally just apply in your guaranteed admission. 
Lil Wayne went to college. Who knew? I mean, you look at the names and you look at the accomplishments and you look at where they went to school and there should be something that kind of awakens inside of you that should tell you something. That message is coming. There's a lot of writing on this page. I'm actually just going to shut up for a second. I'm going to let you read it, digest it, and we can discuss it for just a minute. So go ahead, read what's on your screen, guys. Okay, so I want to make sure we're clear about the value of college. So many of us get sucked into this belief that if you go to this ultra elite school, you're good. Life is taken care of, your spouse is taken care of, your job is taken care of, your money is taken care of, your life is taken care of, everything is great. That is not true. There is no evidence to support that. Will you? at least be able to say your first job is going to probably pay you more money and it's going to be easier to get that first job. Yeah, I'll concede that, no problem. But when you get done with that first job and you start looking at the second, what you're going to find is where you got your degree is now less important and what you did at that first job is more important. So don't lose sight of that idea. The second piece is, is more about what you read in that final uh, bullet point. Colleges do a lot of the same things, regardless of where you go. They're helping you become better versions of yourself. They're helping you grow up and mature. They're helping you think better. They're helping you write better. They're helping you discover a better sense of self. They're helping you understand how to work with the rest of the world. Almost any school accomplishes all of these tasks, maybe in different ways, but they all have the ability to help you. And guys, it's not like physics is different at, at one school versus another, or math is different at one school. Calculus is calculus. Physics is physics. Chemistry is chemistry. Biology is biology. Um, the literature is the literature. Interpretations will vary a little, but at the end of the day, 99% of what you learn is in the same lane. So the slide that I really want you to walk away with tonight, come hell or high water. Recognize that with very few exceptions, the undergraduate school, the bachelor's degree program that you attend does not make or break who you are. It does not necessarily determine how much money you will make or determine what jobs you're going to have or how happy you're going to be or how long you're going to live. You will make you happy and you will make you successful. The notion that we can somehow say, well, our drive and our determination and our, our will to be great got us into this selective college. Now it's up to them. I've done my bit. I'm, I'm done. No. Now you're in a much more competitive environment and you're still fighting for the same things you were in high school. You're fighting for grades. You're fighting for research opportunities. You're fighting for the attention of your instructors not as much as you think has changed. So understand that your drive and your commitment and your desire to be the best you you can be, that's what really matters. Okay, so my own story is not exactly a textbook. You know, I majored in political science at UCLA as an undergrad, and I got my degree. I was a mediocre student. I was not a particularly good fit for UCLA. Um, had no idea really why I got a degree in political science other than it seemed like at the beginning of my time as an undergraduate student, perhaps I would be interested in politics. I ruled that out about nine months into my stay. And I was so naive that I didn't want to change majors. I didn't want to you know, rock the boat. I wanted to still try to get done in four years, which I wasn't able to do because I added a specialization in business administration onto my degree. 
I graduate. I have no idea what I'm doing. I have no idea where I'm going. I don't think I can get a job, certainly using the degree I've earned. And I punted. And I applied to some graduate schools and I got into all but one, UCLA wised up. And there were some good schools on my list. I even got money at several of them. I still couldn't afford them. So kind of tail between my legs, I moved back to the San Fernando Valley, which is where I was raised. And I decided I'll just go to Cal State University Northridge because I know I can afford it. I walked in a month after the deadline for graduate admissions, explained my situation, and they said, oh, sure, we're, we're, we're glad to have you come here. I swear that actually happened. I walked in, they're like, you missed the deadline. I'm like, I understand that. I've already been admitted to some great graduate schools, but I think I might be an even better fit here. Gave them my background and they said, oh, sure, we're happy to have you. Earned a master's degree in U.S. and military history, which you can see I'm using right now. Did not learn a darn thing in terms of how to go through this process. I had a great time in graduate school. Um, I did learn a lot. I met my wife, which worked out pretty well for me. Um, but at the end of the day, I got that degree. I spent some time at NASA. Um, and here I am, I'm a college counselor. And the reason I'm a college counselor is because I can look back on all the mistakes that I made as a student. I didn't know what I was doing. I'm a first generation college student. Parents, grandparents didn't go to college. I'm the eldest child. So I had to figure it out on my own. And looking back at all the mistakes that I made, I have a lot of value that I bring to other families to make sure they don't end up like me. As strange as that might sound. So Understand that in this day and age, we can look at a lot of data and the data generally tells us what's really going on versus our sentiment. So I took a look at one of the best sources available, which is sponsored by Georgetown University Center on Education and the Workforce. And they focus on things like schools with the best return on investment or majors with the highest payouts and salaries from what schools. And so I dug into some of that data in recent history and what I found was pretty interesting. So the key findings from Georgetown's report um, was number one, that private colleges and universities on average beat their public counterparts over the lifetime of employment in terms of income. Uh, that community colleges and some certificate programs which go as early as K through 12 have the highest return on investment in the short term but are frequently overtaken by bachelor's degree or advanced degrees as you move forward in time in the work cycle. The third is that the highest group of return on investment schools were none other than liberal arts colleges, earning on average more than $200,000 more over the lifetime of income than the median college in the list. It was on par with engineering schools, technical programs, and four-year business programs. Interesting stuff. Now, the CEW broke down these values in 10-year increments. So I looked at 10 years after graduation, who had the highest return on investment in the United States. I then looked again at 40 years after. And what I found was pretty darn interesting. Take a look at your screens. So 10 years after graduating from this program, whatever the program is, who had the highest ROI or return on investment in the United States? You take a look at all of those names and none of them should be familiar to you. Um, you're probably noticing that three different times you see B-O-C-E-S on this list. I had to look it up, I actually wrote a note down. It says a uh, board of cooperative educational services. It is a K through 12 program. So if you, if you take a look and see what's going on, you've got a certificate program in nursing. You've got a technical school in um, a certificate program. You've got another practical nursing program certificate, another practical nursing program certificate. Now you have your first bachelor's degree program, St. Louis College of Pharmacy. Number six in the same family, the Albany College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences in New York. Another BOCES nursing program, another technical school nursing program, 
Are you seeing the pattern here? This should make a lot of sense because these programs cost little to nothing and have very high starting initial salaries. Think about what a nurse makes day one. In the state of California, you're probably looking at high five figures. If you have a certificate that costs you little to nothing and you start a job paying 90,000, that's a heck of an ROI, isn't it? Now, we flash forward to the end of our careers. We're now in our 60s. What's the data tell us this time? So no certificate programs, no associate's degrees, they're all bachelor's degrees or higher. I've singled out the bachelor's degrees to make a point. But there's Albany and St. Louis College of Pharmacy sitting at the top. They didn't give up the ghost. Uh, Massachusetts College of Pharmacy joins the party. So clearly, this is an industry that has a very strong ROI. Then you have MIT and Stanford, and then a little later, Harvard and Georgetown. But there's also some other names in there that you should probably be like, hmm, Maine Maritime Academy and the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy? What's going on here? Ocean engineering, high-paying field. Not a lot of people working in it, but there's plenty of jobs, apparently. And these organizations have very low cost of attendance or none. If we're talking about the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy, um, no cost. You're giving your service to the, the military, and then you can choose whatever branch of service you want. And then you get a job working on a ship. You're either a pilot or you're an engineer, a marine engineer, or you're re repairing ships. These are all high-paying jobs. So... Maybe not all the names you were expecting at the very top of the list, and certainly not in the first group. So again, look at the trends and get a sense of what is it trying to tell you. Okay, the next piece of CEW data that I looked at was examining 10 very popular areas of study in college, okay? Business, health professions, which I nailed to nursing, social sciences and history, I stuck with history. Engineering, biological and biomedical science. I swung to biomedical engineering to make a point. Uh, psychology, communication, journalism, visual and performing arts, education, and computer and information sciences are 10 of the most popular majors or areas of study in America. Over the next few screens, you're going to see, as of the time this data was pulled, who were the five highest monthly income earners based on where they got their degree. Pay attention. I'm going to cycle through this. I'm going to switch screens every 10 or 15 seconds or so. So get ready, see what you see, and then we'll discuss in just a moment. Here we go. Business is up first. Four pretty common names and then Bismarck State College? But don't pay attention to that. Take a look specifically at the numbers. What kind of money is being made with this degree? Remember, these are monthly incomes. Nursing. If you're in California, you should be feeling pretty good about yourself. History degrees. I mean, look at the difference. Sonoma State, Cal State East Bay, Sac State, Samuel Merritt University and Pacific College. Look at what those people make. Now look at the people who went to Duke, Penn, Dartmouth, Yale, and Williams. Hmm. Engineering. Berkeley, MIT, Washington, Carnegie Mellon, and Duke. Big names, big payouts. Biological engineering. Penn, Duke, Penn State, Hopkins, and Texas A&M. All very big names. Pretty significant difference in the payouts. Psychology, perhaps the one I like to pick on the most. Again, look at the names. Tufts, Barnard, Cornell, Colgate, Stanford, Yale. Come on. Look what they make. Guys, for those of you thinking, I'm going to get a degree in psychology because it's really interesting. It is really interesting. And you can't get a job with a bachelor's degree in psychology. The job does not exist. So if you're going to get that degree, know in advance you're going to graduate school. Just bet on it, plan on it, know you're going to pay for it. 
but allowing you to get to that advanced degree means you can actually get a job that pays more than what you see on the screen. Communication and journalism, again, not a notoriously high paying career. The lowest is VPA. Every now and then someone's going to hit a home run and they're going to become a big star. They're going to be on Broadway. They're going to be in Nashville. They're going to be somewhere big. And then the other 98.5% are going to be wait staff or waiting for the dream to happen or homeless or wherever you end up. Look what the numbers are telling you. I mean, basically, if you're below the top five schools, you're in the poverty range in the United States. It says something. Education for my friends who want to work in K-12 and your golden hearts, bless you. We need good teachers, but understand that the numbers don't lie. Starting salaries to be a K-12 through teacher, not big. So this should tell you, you need to think very carefully about where you're getting degrees, how long it takes to get your degrees, and what states you're getting your degrees, so you don't end up in a bad spot, okay? Now, the one you've all been waiting for, the five highest paying programs in the United States are all in the same field, computer and information sciences. Not that this is a big surprise. Brown, Carnegie Mellon, Penn, Stanford, and Harvey met all big names, big payouts. So understand, you saw many of these names earlier, but you were making a fraction of the money. So what is all of this data telling you? What you are majoring in is likely going to be more important. Don't look at my story. But it's more likely that what you major in will be more important than where you get your bachelor's degree. Uh, there are also some majors and schools that are worth spending that top dollar for. Knowing that, hey, if I get this degree from this school, I have an expectation that I'm going to be well compensated for my successes. So that's probably worth taking out that loan and spending a little bit more than perhaps you wanted to. But then again, if you're in a field that is notoriously low paying, why on earth would you be attending a private school with little or no financial funding behind you to end up with a degree that's going to get you into a job that's never going to keep up with the loan payments? Think this through, guys. Okay, for those of you who are thinking, you know, Rob, uh, is college really worth it? You know, I, I, I hear this all the time. Here's the data. Data doesn't lie. Forbes got it from the same source I've been getting mine from, which is Georgetown CEW. This is what the data says. The more education you get, the more likely it is you're going to make more money. It's not a real big surprise for those of us who've gone off to college. Um, also, it generally says things like you're less likely to be unemployed. You are more likely to live longer and live happier lives. I mean, it's up to you. Okay, so I've mentioned some of this before. You're going to come to the conclusion that the majority of American colleges can provide you or your child with a world-class education, access to knowledgeable, maybe not outstanding professors, and that has very little to do, by the way, with what school name is on the outside of the building has a lot more to do with them personally and what their mission is for their school. Some professors are paid to teach. Most professors are paid to research and publish. Keep that in mind. Uh, what about those research opportunities? How bountiful are they? Um, travel abroad opportunities. Almost everyone I talk to has a travel abroad opportunity. It's a question of how it gets leveraged. Um, do they have an internship and a preliminary job placement office? Most do, and most are pretty good at what they do if you leverage it. Um, the bigger question is, are you finding the right fit and not worried about what's the admission percentage at the school? That is a measurement of popularity, not successful educational opportunities. Um, one of the things I want you to think about Well, you've already seen this stuff, so I won't, I won't bother you with it. Um, what things really do or don't matter. Um, guys, I am a 
I am a negative Nancy when it comes to the college ranking guides. In particular, US News and World Report. It's the most popular. It's used by more people on the planet than any other. I think it's a trash fire. And you might be thinking, that's blasphemy. How could you say it's a trash fire? Because it is. Um, take the time to actually read how US News and World Report rankings work and how they assemble them and what the values are that they look at. At least a third of the ranking is garbage. Like it, it has no bearing on anything. It's filling space. It doesn't actually equate to anything that your child or you care about. So why do we put such stock in it? Now, making things worse is the notion that those same colleges and universities, A, know that they're worthless, but B, it doesn't matter if they think it's worthless because you, the public, both nationally and internationally, read them, care about them, and value them. So much like a cat chasing its own tail, colleges do the same things. So for instance, um, a couple of years ago, one of the values, one of the formula values was added in for a first time. US News and World Report looked at something called Pell Grant eligible values. What does that mean? It means what percentage of the incoming student body is Pell Grant eligible? meaning they're receiving federal funding, grant money, that they don't have to repay. Well, the higher the number, the higher the rank score. So guess what colleges and universities at the top of the food chain did? To maintain or improve their ranking, in that year, there was a spike in the number of Pell-eligible students that were admitted in that given year. So if you were just on the right side of that argument, schools that you really had no business getting into you were somehow getting into in that year because it was advantageous based on ranking values. Unfortunately, if you were just the other side and you just missed qualifying for that Pell Grant, your odds of getting into those same schools dropped precipitously. Not because you were a good candidate or a bad candidate, but because you didn't check a statistical relevant box in the given year. So how much do you really care about these stupid things after all? What are a few areas that you should be looking at that are relevant values? Uh, number one is the school's retention rate. The second one is the school's four-year or six-year graduation rate. So let's start with retention rate. What's that? What percentage of the students show up, complete the first year, and re-enroll and pay tuition for year two? That's retention. If that number is below 90%, you're probably in a school that's not getting the job done. The second number, four-year and six-year graduation, and I know what you're thinking, why would I look at a six-year graduation? I consider that failing. I want to see four-year graduation. I agree with you. Most U.S. schools do not publish a four-year graduation readiness value. Why? Because most students don't graduate in four years even at a private school. Private schools are much better than public schools when it comes to that data. Uh, their numbers are closer to 70%. Public schools are closer to 50%. So if I told you in advance, half the students make it out in four and half the students don't, might that make you a bit more nervous and maybe a bit more cautious about what's this costing us already? And now my kid's gonna stick around for another year? I'd look and see what their success rates are. How fast are kids getting through the program in a meaningful and relevant amount of time? That says if the school's getting the job done or not. Okay, um, I'm actually going to minimize my screen for a sec to get a sense of where we are. We are good on time, so we're gonna keep going. So don't mind me. Okay, the second part of this presentation is going to address, Rob, we appreciate you telling us this and, and, you know, God bless you for doing so, but we're really here to figure out how to get into those most elite, those highly selective schools. Can you give us a little information about that? Sure, I can. 
So what are the values in Rob's rough order of consideration that highly selective schools are going to, in most instances, consider in some way, shape, or form? Curriculum, grades, or GPA, test scores, depends where you apply, application essays, extracurricular activities, letters of recommendation, possibly demonstration of interest, and possibly an interview. Now, understand that the order changes based on the school. The number of items used depends on the school. So if we went with let's say Cal Poly San Luis Obispo inched down a little bit more this year and got down to 25% admission. They become a highly selective college. Well, what values do they look at from this list? Number one and number two. And that's it. They will look at your curriculum, focusing on 10th and 11th. They will look at your grades, looking exclusively at 10th and 11th. They will look at your declared major, they will look at where you come from and they will say yes or no. That's it. What about a UC school? What about a UCLA or a Berkeley? Or now you can say an Irvine, I think it's just underneath that threshold now too. Um, they will look at curriculum, focus 1011. Grades, focus 1011. Application essays, there's four of them. And they'll look at your extracurricular activities. They'll look at a declared major, where you're from, and they will come up with an answer. Maybe we're talking about a school like USC. They'll look at curriculum throughout grades through 11th grade. If you apply regular decision, they'll see first semester of 12th grade. Uh, they'll look at a test score if you offer it up to them. They'll look at application essays. They'll look at extracurriculars. They'll look at a letter of recommendation. They say they do not look at demonstration of interest and they don't interview. It depends where you're looking to go. What are all the things you don't control? You should be aware of these as well because they do matter. You just don't necessarily know how and when they matter. So what are we talking about? Your student's ethnicity or race. Are they a first-generation student? Remember I said I'm a first-generation student, the first in my family to go to college? That's a big plus. Socioeconomic status, stated sex or religion, geographic location, Legacy status. Did you have an immediate family member attend and graduate from that school? Is the applicant related to a school employee? Not only can this help in terms of admission, but there can be huge tuition benefits available to that family. Nine is frankly the most interesting one. Does the student fulfill an institutional need? We don't control these things. We're not going to talk about them just uh, at this stage of the game, but understand that some schools will pay attention to these values, especially towards the end of rounding their classes out to shape the class the way they want it to look. Okay. And you won't ever know it actually happened. Now we'll go through each of these values in terms of the ones you directly control as a student and get a better sense of what matters. Curriculum. Still number one on my list. I believe it's number one on most people's lists. What did you take in high school versus, versus what was offered to you? What did you take outside of your high school curriculum that was available to you? Um, it goes without saying you're supposed to push yourself academically when it comes to a highly selective school. If you're not, you're not competitive. I don't care what your GPA says. But there's a difference between... I'm going to challenge myself academically and I'm going to throw myself off of a cliff because I'm going to take so many AP or IB courses that I cannot possibly keep up and do well in these classes. Oh, by the way, I also will have no life and no outside time for extracurriculars. You've actually defeated the purpose. That's not what colleges are after. Challenge yourself and challenge yourself in areas where you are interested in learning, not Oh, I heard AP art history is an easy A, so I'm going to take it to get the GPA bump. Take the class if you really have a fascination with it or if it ties into something you want to do in your future, whether it be a major or a career. Okay. Yes, take an IB class and pass the exam. Take an AP exam and pass the exam. You can shave time and money off of your college experience, which is a huge win. 
but in its proper time and its proper place. GPA and grades, everyone knows this. You don't need me to tell you this. Um, what I do need to tell you is there's about 12 different ways to calculate a GPA. Some will look at 9, 10, 11, beginning of 12. Some will look at 10 and 11 only. Some will look at 10, 11, first semester 12. Some will look at 9, 10, 11 only. Some will take all of the AP, IB, and honors courses. Some will take a limited number of them. Don't try to play the numbers game with everyone. You can't win everywhere. Are you in the ballpark for the schools you're targeting, which I generally say is about a third of a GPA point? You can make the claim that you're smart enough to go here, but that's not going to be the reason you get in. I can't tell you how many times I have a family will come up to me after a presentation and say, hey, Rob, you know, my son has a 4.25 GPA and a 1380 SAT score. Can they get into fill in the blank school? From my perspective, you have two strikes on you already because you're relying on factors that don't speak to your child's character. What have they done beyond class? Because everyone has a classroom record. And if you're applying to a highly selective college, you can bet your bottom dollar, it's a really good record, okay? Um, the other thing I want you to understand in terms of that curricular value and the grades is we wanna see a trend line which goes up, or if you start awesome, stay awesome. So if you take one AP class in 10th grade, there's an expectation you will push yourself a little bit further in 11th and possibly a little bit further in 12th. Doesn't mean you go from one to five. That's not a good plan. But challenge yourself each year. Very important. Standardized testing. Um, clearly, again, it still depends on where you're applying. If you're applying to a UC or a Cal State, this literally does not matter. Test blind is the usage or the term name for schools in the United States that no longer consider an SAT or ACT score in an admission decision. It doesn't necessarily mean that AP or IB scores aren't still factored into the play, but SAT and ACT, not part of the deal here at a public school in California, so not a big deal. But if you're applying anywhere else, you're almost always looking at a school that is either test optional or test recommended, or test required. You need to know what your schools are asking for in the coming year. Um, SAT and ACT are interchangeable. There's no school in America that will say you can use one test but not the other. So experiment with them. Get a sampling of questions from both exams. Try them and go, oh, I think I like the layout of this one better than this one. Great, take that test. Um, I would give yourself enough time to take whichever tests you're gonna take at least twice. Why? Data from the testing companies themselves says very clearly, your second effort is likely going to be your best one. You've seen it, you've done it, you've been there, you know the experience, you know the check-in process, you know the basic timing of the test, you know the structures of the questions. There's no real surprises anymore. You should do better. Most U.S. schools are still test optional. Every year, that number will change a little bit. How, we don't necessarily know. One or two schools will move to the test blind. Others will go back to test required. Others will say, we like this test optional thing. If it helps you, great, submit your score. If it doesn't help you, fine, we'll evaluate you without it. I do want you to understand that if you can turn in a good score, that is better than not turning one in for obvious reasons, you know? So I would still encourage you to think about this process. And if it really isn't your thing, okay, you still have an in at 99% of the schools. But you, again, you want to check and see who's on the good side and who's on the not so good side in that situation. So visit fairtest.org for a list of all of the test optional test blind schools in the U.S. Um, there are some obvious equity issues with these exams. That's why they were banned in the public schools in California. Those equity issues are being worked on by places like the College Board, and there are some major changes coming to the standardized testing world, um, mostly in 2024. So for those of you graduating now or in the next year, it's not going to affect you. But sophomores and freshmen, 
you're going to be dealing with a very different standardized testing universe. We'll get to that another time. Application essays, literally, they're the heart and soul of your college application. What do you care about? What are you interested in? Why are you interested in it? Why are you interested in us? What makes you special or different compared to your peers? Are you a likable person? Do I want to hang out with you? Like these are the types of things we're thinking about when it comes to evaluating an application essay. They require a lot of time, guys. Trust me as someone who reads a lot of essays every year from his clients, let them take time. So that means for those of you who are juniors, you should start this writing process over the summer before you start your senior year. It doesn't mean you should try to finish everything, but you should get your feet wet. Write those preliminary UC drafts or that common app main essay or coalition app main essay. Get your feet wet. For those of you who are seniors watching this presentation, if you haven't started writing, what are you waiting for? Your clock's gonna run out. Um, these are not technical essays, though clearly if you're a lousy writer, it's gonna come back to bite you. It's more about the understanding of the human being. I mean, think about a UC application. The person, or I should say people, reading your application will never talk to you. They're never gonna meet you. They're never gonna have an exchange of any kind with you. All they get to see is this dossier electronically and these four essays. They're trying to get to know you. They're trying to figure out what kind of a roommate are you going to be? What kind of a lab partner are you going to be? What kind of contributor to the campus community are you going to be? Um, do they see you being happy and successful on their campus based on what they learn about you? That's what really matters. Um, so yeah, if you want to bring in an editor, bring in an editor who yeah is going to help you with grammar, syntax, word choice, but make sure you stay in your lane. Um, and for God's sake, don't hire someone to write the essays for you. Not only is it just a really crappy thing to do, but number two, you're going to find that that person doesn't sound like you, doesn't articulate like you. And then you'll have a couple of things you'll still have to throw into your applications that will make it very clear to someone who reads essays over and over and over and over again, that the person who wrote this one and the person who wrote that one isn't the same person. Crumple them up, throw them in the garbage extracurricular activities. It's anything you do outside of class. Um, back when I was applying to college, dinosaurs walk in the face of the earth. It was really more about quantity. Like how busy were you? Um, how many activities were you involved in might dictate how social you were, how active you were. In this day and age, quantity is less important than quality. Okay. Focus on the things that truly matter to you. Um, my rules are very simple. When I talk to my students about extracurriculars, there's two rules. If you follow them, you're good. Rule number one is do what you love. Don't fake this. Do something that you're going to sink your heart and soul into, that you're going to really try to get the best outcome you can. Don't join that third club because you feel like colleges want to see at least three. That's a waste. Your time is precious. Everyone knows this. So think very carefully about what are you really going to work hard at that you think you're going to enjoy that's going to help you grow as a human being. Second rule is at least one time every year, you should try an extracurricular activity that helps you better understand yourself from the perspective of major or career. So many students are under the impression they're supposed to know by the time they go off to college what they're going to do in college and for the rest of their lives. The fact of the matter is that's not true, but that doesn't mean you should simply ignore it either. If you can figure out what you really like, or hey, I tried something and I thought it was going to be awesome and it totally sucked. Great. That's still a victory. Now I know I don't want to go do that. Fine. Let's keep working at what you do want to do. So you don't end up taking a job because you needed money like someone else did to get into this industry. Okay, we're now moving into the part where not everyone requires them, but you should still be keenly aware that if you're applying to most highly selective schools, you're going to need one or more of these. Letters of rec. Um, sometimes they're required. Sometimes they are optional. 
Um, I've seen one or two schools that had five optional letters. Does that mean you should send five letters? No, it means you send as many great letters as you have. If that's one or two or three great, you send them because you believe they're going to be great. Do not find a fourth or a fifth letter because quantity is not more important than quality. There are three different types of letters of recommendation. Okay, you have a counselor letter, you have a faculty letter, you have an other letter. Let's talk about them. The counselor letter is coming from either the college office or a guidance counselor's office. Um, depends on your school situation. Um, most families kind of panic when I say that and they're thinking, wait, there's 1,500, 2,000, 3,000 students who go to my school and how many work with my counselor? My counselor, we see them once a year. Take it easy. The letter is more contextual in nature. Okay. It's about putting your child in the context of their graduating class more than the specific relationship you have with that counselor. Sure, that's an added bonus. So if you can build a relationship with that counselor, please do so. But understand it's not a make or break situation, especially at a public school. The most important letter of recommendation is going to come from your teachers, your faculty members. Um, I recommend the core four, English, math, social science, or lab or physical science. You typically don't wanna draw from music or a coach or a language teacher, unless you're gonna major in that field of study. This is about that teacher's knowledge of you over a significant period of time within the confines of the classroom. What makes you special or different within that learning environment? So think about the relationships you've built with those faculty members. It can't just be, I got a 97 in Mrs. Smith's class, so I'm going to ask her for a letter. Not enough. Why do you want that letter from Mrs. Smith? What is it that she knows about you that is going to provide for a great letter of recommendation? So are you building those sort of trait ladders that they can then look upon and go, okay, this is why I want to write this great letter for, for Johnny. You know, if it's just a, a grade, look, lots of people in your class got A's, I guarantee it. Why should that teacher write the letter for you? Think about it and work on it throughout the year. In a perfect world, you're looking at 11th grade faculty is your primary target because A, it's fresh in their mind and they've had you for a full year. 12th grade faculty is not a target. That's a fallback position because they don't know you nearly as well. You're asking for that letter. It's been less than 60 days. What is it they're supposed to say? You think about that. So build foundational relationships. Now, if you have a 12th grade teacher you had in 10th grade, they know you. That's totally fine. But if it's a first time teacher who doesn't really know you, you're rolling the dice with that letter. The other LOR is pretty much anyone else. As I mentioned, it could be that, that music teacher, the coach, a uh, language instructor, if you're not applying in that field, more likely it's an internship supervisor or an employer or a volunteer coordinator, a clergyman, someone who knows you outside of the scholastic environment who wants to describe something about you that's likely different than the person we're getting to know through other letters of recommendation through the campus community. Um, Demonstrated interest is one most people are unfamiliar with, and at most highly selective schools, they are not going to pay a whole heck of a lot of attention here, but that's not why I'm putting it on the list. This is a two-way street. Demonstrated interest is a way for you to get to know the college or university and for the college or university to get to know you. How is this helpful? Number one, if it is a school that uses a demonstration of interest, they're looking at have you called us, emailed us, made an official visit to campus, taken an official tour, talked to a representative at a college fair? How have you connected with us and learned about us? Gives us in the Office of Admission a sense of how serious a person you are about our school. We know you're applying broadly. You're probably applying to 10 or more schools. So we know on paper we have a 10% chance or less of getting you. But a student who's demonstrated a lot of interest when we're allowed to pay attention to it gives us a sense that maybe you're a bit more serious about us 
than other schools. That could help your cause. But more importantly, it's you getting a clearer sense of what you're buying as a customer. Yeah, you can look at ranks, which we've already discussed, and you, know, you can get a sense of looking at a picture or two or you know, talking to someone who's been there or just you know, your neighbor says, wow, that'd be so great if you could go to Yale. Everyone loves Yale. Yale's the best. But based on what? Based on its name, its brand, its rank, it's an, a member of the Ivy League, which, by the way, is a crappy sports league. Don't get too concerned about this. So do your homework. That's essentially what demonstrated interest is. And then for you as a student who goes through and demonstrates it in a really meaningful way, it's actually going to help you write some of these essays back to the school, giving them a sense of really why you should be selected instead of someone else who maybe is just relying on their curriculum and their grades and maybe a test score. But there's a clear reason for you to be there specific to your wants and needs and what you bring to the table versus their wants and needs and what they bring to the table. It can matter. Interview is eighth for a reason. Not a lot of schools require them. Um, and believe it or not, when it says optional, it's optional. Um, and this is really done for an obvious reason. For a student who is quiet and shy and is not going to make a favorable impression and really doesn't want to strike up a conversation over 30 or 40 minutes with a complete stranger, why put you through that to not make a great impression? That's not it. If you're not going to engage in the process, by the way, it's not called an interview. It's called an interrogation. So figure out your personality. And if you feel you want to demonstrate that interest and you do want to have a conversation, ask some questions of an alum or an admission rep, by all means, avail yourself of it. But it's the eighth factor for a reason. It's usually not enough to move the needle unless you're an on-the-fence candidate. Okay, the evaluation process at most of these schools is done through something we call the holistic process, meaning each reader, and there's usually two or more of them, will read all of the values provided in that single application and provide a single score or rating to the applicant. So if we're the UCs, most UCs, not all, but most UCs use a holistic read. So at UCLA, they'll look at your curriculum and they'll look at your grades and they'll look at your four personal insight questions and they'll look at your extracurricular activities and they will form a single opinion and give you a single score. Most of the public schools that are less competitive may actually break some of these numbers down and turn it into a math equation. Your GPA is worth this amount. Your standardized test score is worth that amount. We add them together. You go into a list based on your major. We say yes up to this line. It's a very different way of reading. But understand at the highest echelons, you're talking about a holistic read, which means they read everything at one time and give you one score. When the decisions are too close to call, either because you're an on-the-fence candidate and an on-the-fence candidate after being read twice, or... Someone gave you a really high score and a not so good score, and someone's like, wait, something's wrong here. They'll bring in a couple more readers to reevaluate your process. And either they'll tip you forward or tip you back. If you still stay on the line, most of the time you end up in a situation where you're waitlisted. Um, in rare instances, you will go to committee, which is really what you imagine it to be. It's a bunch of people sitting around a desk. One person for your particular area will read over your application, share it with the group, make a pro argument. Others will try to say why that maybe you're not such a great fit. Hands up, hands down. What's the majority? You go into a pile. Maybe it's yes, maybe it's no, maybe it's waitlist. Now, at this stage of the game, if you remember a few slides ago, the very last thing I had on things that are beyond your control institutional need. This is where institutional need can come in with its invisible hand and move you around the piles, sometimes multiple times without you ever knowing it. So an institutional need, let's think about a wait list as the, the easiest way to explain this process. Let's say I'm the dean or director of admission at a small private school and my incoming class is 1,000 students. 
and it's April 30th. And I've looked at the data and I know instead of a thousand, I only have 940. I have 60 empty seats. Am I just going to let those 60 seats go unfilled? Uh-uh. That's money. That's revenue. That's keeping our bills paid. That's keeping the lights on. That's keeping our professors paid. That's purchasing whatever we need to purchase. It's maintaining payroll. I need to find those 60 seats. Well, how am I going to find those 60 seats? Oh, well, I, I do have a wait list. I, I, I plan for these things. And my wait list is 400 names long and I need 60. How am I going to choose? Normally, someone would raise their hand and say, well, the smartest student will get selected. No, that's not necessarily true. It's actually unlikely that that's going to be the first reason on the list. I'm going to look at institutional needs. Those could be anything from, we have way too many females in the incoming class. We need more males. Okay, so I got a little whiteboard. Males. Okay, then I'm looking at things like, how many of the 50 states do we have represented in our incoming class? We have 48 states represented. Hey, that's great. Who are the two missing ones? Oh, the Dakotas. North Dakota, South Dakota. So if you're a male from the Dakotas, you're looking real good right now if you're on my wait list. Are there particular colleges or majors that are under-enrolled that I need to bring more kids in for? Write that on the board. Maybe there's a specialty need. We received a $5 million grant that is supposed to go, go towards females in engineering. Guess what? If you're a female engineer, you're in luck. Female engineer, you're probably getting one or two of those slots that are available. So know that you can move from the yes pile to the no pile to the maybe pile and back and forth based on the needs of an institution. This really does happen. You won't know it though. Okay, this is what we call rounding out a class. That is the warp speed version of a 40 slide presentation. And I hope I didn't lose you guys in this process. So number one, this is your opportunity to ask any questions you want. Please post them in the chat box and we will go through them in the order that they are posted. For those of you who are like, yeah, I'm not asking a public question. Can I just email you? Please do. My email address is on your screen. Jot it down. Take a picture with your phone. Follow up with me anytime. I'm happy to help. Maybe you want to get a sense of some other stuff that I've, I've posted in the past, interviews I've done. Uh, you just want some general information about me. I create that little QR code in your upper left-hand screen so you can check that cool stuff. Feel free to get out your cameras, get out your QR reader, and you can be directed to a website which will have a bit more information about me. Um, that said, the floor is yours. I'm going to open up the chat and see. I have, Rob, a few questions that were sent directly to me. That oh, yes. You yes, yes. I'm just going to read them to you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, of course. So the first question is, what are suggested ways to learn about smaller colleges we may not be familiar with? Wow, that's a really good question. What I said, I know. There's a lot of ways you can do this. Um, I'll give you one that you've probably heard of, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. Uh, CTCL, Colleges That Change Lives, is a great book that was put out a long time ago, and it gets frequently updated. It's become kind of a cult following. Um, typically, there's 40 or so schools that get mentioned each year in their book or online. These are almost all smaller, medium-sized schools that do an extraordinary job of offering kids an opportunity to really dig into their passions, interact with their, their professors, their peers. And it does a really good job of highlighting names that aren't necessarily household, that do a magnificent job of providing kids with a well-rounded education. I would start with CTCL. Um, in terms of like if you said, is there a good database? If we're looking for something really simple, the College Board has a really nice interface that's pretty easy to work with. However, once you start putting in things like majors, all bets are off. Um, their site is really, really lackluster when it comes to matching the college and the major together. 
Trust me, I build college lists for every single one of my clients and I have to go literally school by school by school to find exactly what I'm looking for. So from a generalist perspective, I think that's a great place to start. Um, but be careful about using too many of the values, in which case sometimes it can lead you a bit astray. That's where I would start. And thank you for the question. Okay, so I think you might have answered the next question. Um, let's see here. What is your take on going to college out of country? Ooh, actually, I did not. I did not address that. Um, I think it's great. Um, and I'll give you a couple of different perspectives on this. The first is, if you said, I really want an American college experience, but not necessarily in America, can I do that? Yes, you can. Um, there are a number of schools, particularly in Europe, that will give you a kind of liberal arts style um, educational experience using the four-year curriculum of the U.S., versus the three-year curriculum of many European and other international destinations. Why is this important? The three-year program is great for someone who says, I know precisely what I want to do, why I want to do it, how I want to do it. Hey, let's just get to it, shall we? I think the European model works better for those students. For everyone else who's still trying to figure it out or wants a kind of blended well-rounded educational experience, you don't get that in that European model. You do in the American model. Um, Canada. Who doesn't like Canada? I mean, really, come on now. Um, there are some fantastic schools uh, in uh, the uh, territory to our north. Um, there are fewer options, though. Here in the United States, we have approximately 1,750 four-year not-for-profit schools that we get to choose from. We are really lucky in that benefit. How many four-year not-for-profit schools are there in Canada? I believe there's 92. So you got to be a little picky. I will also tell you many of those schools are large and they're public. So schools like UBC, uh, University of British Columbia, great school, but it's got over 50,000 undergraduate students. So be prepared to sit in a large class for a while, just as you would, frankly, at a UC campus. Um, but can you get a great education? Yes. Can you do it for cheaper than in the United States? Most of the time you can. Um, the European three-year schools, mm, some you can, some you can't. The four-year U.S. model almost always will be cheaper than if you stay here. Crazy as that sounds, it is true. So I would encourage you to look into some of those options. Um, see if you can set up uh, Zooms with some of their representatives. Um, they do have some people who come to some of the bigger events here, like at the WACAC college fairs. I would encourage you to reach out and talk to them as well. I've met some really nice people who work in admission offices uh, in Australia and in Europe and in Canada. Um, the standards are a little bit different, um, but I think you'll find if you're competitive for U.S. markets, you're going to be competitive anywhere. Great. Thank you, Rob. All right, we have one, um, and I don't know how much longer you want to go, um, but one last question here that you haven't answered yet, and that is anywhere to look up, quote unquote, rounding out based on institutional need. For example, are there colleges always needing more of a particular race, nope. religion? Nope, sex, it changes so like every single year at every single school. Um, you just don't know who's applying in that given year. Sure, there are patterns, but those patterns aren't shared with us. That's part of the frustration. Even as insiders like us counselors is we don't know what's missing in that last 50 or 100 or 150 seats. We're not privy to it. There's no advertisement that goes out. So literally, you have to hope. And that sounds crappy. And it is crappy. But it's honest. And if I'm going to end on anything, I'm going to end honestly. So... I hope, I mean, I know that's not a terribly helpful answer, but it is an honest one. We really don't know what the needs are from year to year at any particular school because every single year their financial needs change, the number of applications they get changes. Is there an expansion that they're not aware of? Is there a new funding opportunity that created a grant in one particular program where now all of a sudden they have an extra 20 seats because they can fund materials? We don't know. So... 
All we can do is make an educated decision about what we want and why we want it and improve our chances of getting into those institutions. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, that mm -hmm. last question also gave a compliment saying great lecture, which is absolutely true. Thank you. So I think unless you have any directly sent to you, um, I've got the ones sent to me answered and then the ones in the group, I think that I can see all answered. Um, I, I think that this has been great. Rob, thank you so much for your time tonight, for being here to all of our participants. Thank you guys for coming. Um, this great attendance is what keeps us doing these, um, especially in the evenings that, you know, works for a lot of us who are working. So we appreciate you all. We appreciate you students. And um, again, if you weren't able to get this um, QR code, come and take a snap of it real quickly. Um, and again, this, what, this recording will be on our website, uh, counseling as well as the college and career Mrs. Martell has. That's fantastic. Um, it's a great resource. Tell your friends if you thought it was helpful. Um, yes. Because, hey, you know, back in the day, it was I'd show up for a one night show and it was there for an hour. And if you weren't there, tough. And now you can watch it whenever you need to. And I'm certain there are lots of other really good presentations that are in those databases that you can learn a lot from. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Thank you again, Rob, for being here. Thank you. I appreciate your time. Westlake, thank you as always. You guys have a wonderful evening. Awesome. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.